no matter what hour your clock strikes here, it's always Halloween. And I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Welcome to Small Frights Friday. Each week on these episodes, I like to share a curated selection of calls from the All Hallows Hotline and letters from the Eek Mailbag. Before we dig in, I just want to welcome two of our newest Patreon Ghoul Gang members, Maya Bukanyak and Rachel Merrick. I also want to thank Keith Fitzgerald for sponsoring this episode with a one-time donation. If you want to support the podcast, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween or... To make a one-time donation with any amount, you can use Venmo using our email address, it's always Halloween Podcast at gmail.com. If you subscribe on Patreon or make a one-time donation of $10 or more, I'll send you a personalized thank you gift. If you want to be like Keith, and who doesn't? Keith is such a cool dude. You can sponsor a Small Frights episode with a one-time donation of $30 or more. This is all in American dollars. You got to do the conversion yourself. But from what I gather, it's a good deal if you're in Europe. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Rachel, Maya, Keith, and the entire Ghoul Gang for ensuring it's always Halloween stays independent, ad-free, and sustainable. With that, let's hop into the rest of the show. Up first, we have got a really terrific eek mail that has made me laugh so hard every time I read it. So I hope that you all enjoy this as much as I did. The subject line is Neighborhood Haunted House. Hi there. Thought you and the other Luceo Lanterns might like to hear about one of my most memorable trick-or-treating experiences. When I was really little, my parents took me around our neighborhood trick-or-treating. Since you always like to hear about costumes, I was a Ninja Turtle that year. Most of the night was as you'd expect, but one house had a haunted walkthrough for the kids. It was definitely kids only since adults didn't really fit in the hallways that had been created with cardboard boxes, sheets, dim lights, and glow-in-the-dark stickers. In addition to the decorations, the hallway had hidden openings for the family running it to pop out and give you a good jump scare. My parents knew these neighbors, so they knew it was safe to let me go through. I remember it being kind of spooky, nothing too bad for even a very young kid, but there was this one point where there was a curtain. Now apparently all the other kids realized that they were just supposed to go through the curtain, but young little me interpreted the curtain as a barrier. I knew I could move the curtain, but it was closed, and opening a closed curtain would be misbehaving. There was a small gap in the wall before the curtain, so I figured that was the way they had intended me to go, even though I had to crawl to get through. Now, this is where the maze had suddenly gotten a lot scarier for me. Instead of a cute hallway with spooky lights, the path ahead was nearly pitch dark, and miscellaneous junk towered precariously above me. I was so scared of the dark. I was so scared things would fall on me. I was scared of that stark silence on the other side of the wall. I just wanted to get out of there. So I hurried, but there was no longer a clear path. I didn't know which way to go. I bumped into some clutter and it fell over, which prompted me to scream and run in terror. I didn't know where I was going. I was knocking over more and more stuff, searching for a door or a light or my parents. Oh my God, I'm sorry, this line is so funny. I just keep picturing a little ninja turtle. (laughs) But there's this like chaos raining down upon your sweet little head. Aw, okay, let me take it back. I didn't know where I was going. I was knocking over more and more stuff, searching for a door, a light, or my parents. (laughs) In the moment, it felt like I was running around lost and scared for quite a while, but it was probably less than a minute before the bright overhead lights flicked on. (laughs) I thought I was in the scariest part of the haunted maze, but in reality, I had crawled out of the maze and into this family's home. (laughs) 
<laughs> All their furniture and random junk was piled up to make room for the kid-sized Halloween hallway running through their house. The mother of this other family carried me outside to my parents as I cried. Usually my parents only allowed one piece of candy on Halloween night, but that Halloween, they let me have candy until I stopped crying. I'll confess to a little fake crying at the end to get a few extra Snickers. Definitely a Halloween I'll never forget. Love, Pat. Oh my goodness, Pat! I will also never forget this Halloween. This is one of my all-time favorite stories. I could, You just described it so well. I could just see you chaotically tiny and with a little like plastic turtle mask on, just bumping into everything. Did you have a mask or did you paint your face green? Because I've seen both. I was a child who trick-or-treated during the Ninja Turtle craze. In fact, I have a picture of me as a ballerina in a Halloween parade in 1991. Uh, And behind me is a Ninja Turtle with like a really cool fake uh, mask. Fake mask, it's, (laughs) what's the opposite? What is not a fake mask? Somebody who tore the face off a turtle and are wearing it Buffalo Bill style? (laughs) All masks should be fake. Anyways, Pat, this story just brings me so much joy. Like if I had a teleportation device right now, I would I would use it to go back to that moment just to like stand off to the side and see you. Um, not that I want to laugh at your sad, tiny fear, but it's just, it's so sweet. It's so pure and wholesome and like kid brain trying to work out a new space you haven't been in before is just so relatable because when you're a kid, there's always some grown up shuffling you around. You don't really make a lot of decisions about like which way to turn and when you're like constantly being pulled on like a leash or pushed from behind with a strong hand. So to like, to know that like, yes, curtains are not for children, of course, because in the adult world, which is the world that children have to navigate most of the time, especially in the 80s and 90s, a curtain usually meant behind it was pornography (laughs) or it was like somebody else's house or somebody else's space. So I could totally see where you're like, curtain, not for me. And I just, I just think everything about this is so sweet and, and funny and cute. And I love that like you were so scared and then you saw that being really sad got you more candy. So you're like, I'm just the most sad I've ever been. Yes, I will take some more Snickers. Gobble, 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 gobble. Like no tears while you're munching the candy, but then tears again. So you'll get more candy. It's just so perfect. To me, this memory is just like the epitome of Halloween and trick-or-treating. And I just cannot tell you how much joy this brought me. So thank you so much, Pat. Please uh, feel free to share any other memories in the future. And uh, for all of the other Luceo Lanterns out there, I am just obsessed with the trick-or-treat stories I've been getting lately. So do not hesitate to send them in. I absolutely adore them. All right, let's jump into our first call from the All Hallows Hotline. This is coming to us all the way from Lincoln, England, and it is quite haunting. Hello, Luce and fellow Luce Lanterns. It's Rob here from the UK, and today I thought I would share a local legend in the city that I'm currently living in, the city of Lincoln. Now, just for some context, um, there is the quite famous pie shop on top of a really steep hill near the cathedral in Lincoln, and it's been there for many, many years. Um, But the one interesting part about this pie shop is it is allegedly haunted, and apparently it is haunted by at least two spirits. But I'm going to be reading for you um, a recount of just exactly what goes on in this pie shop, and then I'm going to share my personal experiences of said pie shop. Um, I'll also be sending through some images to look at. There's a photograph inside the pie shop of the building when it first opened. And um, if you look in the top window of this black and white photograph, you can see a little boy who is what we're going to discuss right now. Um, So, 
This lovely restaurant at the top of Steep Hill is haunted by what is probably one of Lincoln's most famous ghosts. Humphrey has been featured on the TV programme Most Haunted, and on this has been known to contact Derek Cora. Humphrey is believed to be a young boy, but has only been seen by one person who complained about the staff letting their children run around the restaurant while she was dining in there, alone. There were no children in the building at the time. It is not known why Humphrey haunts the place, but he has been known to get up to all sorts of mischief, particularly if the person he is haunting refuses to acknowledge him. This was particularly found out by one of the chefs who worked at the shop and used to work um, alone in the building for at least an hour every shift. He would often hear noises of somebody running around the building, but upon further inspection, there was nobody there. One day he went to investigate the noises more thoroughly, but couldn't find anybody. However, when he re-entered the kitchen, pots and pans had been moved around from where they had previously been left. Being a little scared by this, he said, Don't mind me, Humphrey. At which point, the sound stopped. Now, I did a lot of research into Humphrey and the pie shop, and the name Humphrey was the name that this particular chef came up with. It's not recorded anywhere that... There is a child of a spirit who was called Humphrey or anything like that. The chef just decided to pick the name Humphrey and it seemed to please the spirit. Continuing on, the noises happened every day when the chef entered work and until he spoke to Humphrey after this, then when they would abruptly stop and nothing else would happen. On a particularly busy Christmas market day, the chef ignored Humphrey's pleas for attention and left the kitchen to bring some supplies down. On returning to the kitchen though, it would appear Humphrey didn't like being ignored, because not only were there pots and pans everywhere, there was a large carving knife sticking out of the floor. Since then, every time staff have been alone in the building, they've been made sure to speak with Humphrey, and have not been disturbed since. Adding to this again, uh, we, uh, me and my friends, would I'll go into later, we did a lot of research into this building, we spoke to some of the staff, it's... Um, a etiquette that when you enter the building if you're opening up or if you're closing to say good morning Humphrey or if you're leaving say good night Humphrey to sort of appease the spirit. The attic is also said to be haunted by the sound of money being counted and then dropped as if the thief had been discovered with the money. Its sound rolls across the floor and then stops abruptly. So that was the second spirit who um, apparently resides inside this quite famous pie shop. Now, the pie shop itself is lovely. Um, it's like I say, we did a project that I majored in drama, and in our final year, our final project, we were doing all about ghost stories, which, as someone who loves Halloween, was fantastic, and I was very excited to be part of. Um, but the, the, perhaps the pie shop drew us in, we heard some stories about it, we went on a ghost walk and learned all the tales that was to know about Humphrey, we interviewed the staff, we interviewed the managers, and then we did our performance inside the pie shop. Now, when we were there, we noticed two things which really terrified us. The first was when you go downstairs to one of the dining areas, it's made of these, like, old stone steps. And when you get down there, there's a stone archway sort of curling around. It's a very confined space, and it's very old-fashioned. But we were looking around the space trying to decide where we would stand, where we would be doing our performance. And then someone lifted their foot and there was this gut-wrenching sort of noise. And we all sort of just stopped dead and looked at each other with like blank faces and wide eyes like, what was that? And we found out later on that... Um, it wasn't anything malicious, it wasn't Humphrey, thank goodness, um, but it was a certain floor, but if you stepped on it, it made this horrendous sound that just really, it sounded like the gates of hell had been opened. So we used that in our performance, and that was fantastic. The only other thing we noticed while we were there is there was a weird uh, interference with our recording equipment and with how we were playing our sp sounds and the Bluetooth we noticed that from going into the basement, the Bluetooth lasted to a certain extent, but then if you went past a certain threshold, the Bluetooth just cut out completely. And luckily, on the day of the performance, everything went according to plan. We all said, good morning, Humphrey, and it went off without a hinge. But we did find it very odd that there was a certain place that just seemed to cancel out any new technology, and it was insane. 
So, that was my story about one of our Lincoln ghosts here, called Humphrey. I've got many more of these Lincoln ghost stories. There's the story of the horseman riding from London to save his friend from execution. Uh, his ghost can be seen on a horse arriving at 3am, which is the time I'm recording now, asking for the gates to be opened, um, but nobody does. There's also the story of a headless priest whose head rolls down the famous deep hill, and you can sometimes feel it. People have said it feels like a leather football hits them in the back of the lee, but that is in fact the headless priest. So if you guys enjoyed this and uh, would like to know any more local uh, Lincoln horror stories, ghost stories, then... I'd be happy to get back in touch, but thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you all have a wonderful day, night, or wherever you are. So long. Wow, Rob, thank you so much for that detailed and well-researched story. I was so creeped out while I was listening to it. Um, I think I've said this before, but I record the podcast in my closet, and so I, uh, my back faces the door. And so I had to keep like, I kept feeling like there was somebody behind me. And I was just, it just made me so nervous. You guys know I'm scared of ghosts. I'm scared, but I love the story. So keep them coming. Um, I cannot wait to go to this little pie shop. Somehow you made it sound really adorable and also like very terrifying, which are my two favorite things. Uh, adjectives, maybe adorable and terrifying. Two favorite adjectives. Um, Robert also sent the best pictures. So we actually have a picture of Humphrey, which I will tell you, very upsetting. Um, and then of the pie shop, which is uh, very cute. He's also very sweet to include a picture of the pies that you can get in the pie shop. I have never been to England. I've never been to Europe. And I just am squealing here thinking about how fun it would be to do these little ghost tours of like all the places that you guys have called in and written in about and how fun it would be to do like a little live episode from the pie shop. Um, but this sounds like you had quite a scary experience, but also an experience that like really like thrilled you and I'm just really grateful that you shared it with us so thank you so much for that and look for the pictures on the it's always Halloween podcast Instagram okay now let's get back to the eek mail bag the subject line for this one is a horror novel for you I've got another horror novel recommendation for you, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danileski. It's a fresh take on the haunted house trope. Instead of the house being haunted by an entity, the house itself is the entity, with the ability to rearrange its rooms and hallways to create new ones. Some unfortunate souls may never find their way out. The text on the page even adapts to evoke a sense of space. For example, it will narrow to a thin line across the page to mimic a narrow hallway. I won't spoil any of it for you. You should read it yourself. But I'll say one more great thing about this novel is that it comes with its own soundtrack. Mark's sister, Anne Danieleski, released an album at the same time called Haunted, that goes perfectly with the book, including lyrical references to the text itself. Thanks, Allison. P.S. I love the show and I'm proud to be a Luceo Lantern. Well, Allison, we are proud to have you as a lantern, and thank you so much. This recommendation warmed my heart because I have attempted to read House of Leaves no less than five times, and it sits, it's perched even, upon the bookshelf that faces me as I sleep, just lurking, waiting, calling, mewling for me to reopen it and try to read it again. I do not say this derisively. I am very pro House of Leaves. I think it is a terrifying book. I think it's why I've stopped it and restarted it so many times. It's also a little bit of a challenge to read, but 
that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it either. It's just, as Allison said, it's written in a very creative way with, uh, it's almost like the uh, infinite jest of horror novels with footnotes and it's a book within a book and uh, there's, you know, different pages are written in different ways. Like one page is a spiral. Some pages are written in all kinds of different fonts. You have to flip from the back to the front to the middle to the back. Um, It is an active book. Do you need your book to engage you more than just a boring old book with words? House of Leaves is for you. Um, I just want to, I'm going to read you a little section of it that I think is very uh, creepy and uh, you can get kind of like a vibe for it. Okay, this is page 119. Jed is the first to voice some concern over how quickly their team leader is moving. Do you know where you're going, Holloway? But Holloway just scowls and keeps pushing forward in what appears to be a determined effort to find something, something different, something defining, or at least some kind of indication of an outsideness to this place. At one point, Holloway even succeeds in scratching, stabbing, and ultimately kicking a hole in a wall only to discover another windowless room with a doorway leading to another hallway, spawning yet another endless series of empty rooms and passageways, all with walls potentially hiding and thus hinting at a possible exterior though invariably winding up just as another border to another interior. As Jared Eisnick famously described it, insides and inness never inside out. And then there's a footnote to this Jared Eisnick, and it says Jared Eisnick's breakthrough, not a breakthrough, heuristic hallways in the Holloway Venture. And so this is a great example. Okay, there's a footnote to a book that doesn't exist. However, there are also footnotes to books that do exist. So peppered throughout, things are referenced that the author has created and things are referenced that are actually created. And it um, it all really helps to encapsulate the madness of the house and the madness of the story. And I think the reason that I have stopped reading it a few times is that it makes me feel a little zany. And sometimes that's a great feeling. It's exciting feeling. It's part of terror, part of revulsion. But sometimes you're not in a place to feel a little zany. Sometimes you actually need to feel very boring in order to make it through the next day. So I love this book. I recommend this book. I love, Allison, that you recommended it to us. It was perfect. And the album that you're talking about, um, so her her name is Anne Danieleski, but it's also Poe. So any uh, any kids out there who grew up listening to the alt-rock of the 90s, Poe, very cool. Loved that album as a kid, did not realize it was connected to this book, until I read the book as an adult. Well, I shouldn't keep saying I read it. I read 200 pages of a 600 page book many times. <laughs> That's how far I've gotten. Um, but I really like the Poe album and I'm excited to revisit it once I actually finish reading the book so I can fully appreciate it. I will link uh, Poe and this book in our show notes so you guys can check it out. And Allison, I just want to say that I noticed that you wrote House in Blue, House of Leaves, and color is very big in House of Leaves. You want to get the color-coded version. That's the one I'm going to link to in the show notes. So I very much appreciate that even in writing the title, you used the correct color that is actually used in the book. Very good attention to detail. All right. Speaking of attention to detail, let us zoom right into another call from the All Hallows Hotline. This one about costumes run amok. Hey, Luce. It's Dusty. And I was just calling um, because I listened to your last Small Frights episode and and had a memory of a a Halloween costume that didn't quite work um, after you told us about your costume mishap with the sheet and the rain and the telephone cord. And I'm so sorry that happened. Um, but I had a Halloween 
where um, my boyfriend and I, my boyfriend at the time and I, um, dressed up as well, sort of porn stars. He was an actual porn star um, from the 70s. I won't, we don't have to talk about who that was because he's a horrible person. Um, but uh, I was <laughs> roller girl because Boogie Nights had been out, um, I think, for like a year or something like that. It was very popular. So this was like the fall of 98, if you can tenure um clock back and remember what that was like <laughs> anyway um i had i because i worked in theater well i was a student in theater at the time i was uh yeah, helping costumes out by reorganizing a costume storage and found these really super cute roller skates like old school roller skates and asked if i could borrow them for halloween because i was like this will be the perfect costume i had a long blonde wig and you know super cute outfit <laughs> and my boyfriend's like, yeah, this would be great. And he, and he borrowed like this weird shirt, this like polyester shirt thing that I had, um, at the time. And, uh, we went, we were, and he had a wig and stuff too. Like it was just, it was just a thing, right? So we were all dressed up and, um, I went to school in one town. He went to school in another. So I was going to where he goes to school and, uh, they had a party at, um, an old train station. And what we didn't know was that the parking lot was like above the train station and you had to like walk down this hill to get to the train station, which meant you had to walk across the tracks. And for some reason at the time, there wasn't a path or anything to go across. So you had to walk across the giant rocks. Like if you've been at train tracks, you know, they have these like huge chunky rocks. And I'm in roller skates, and I'm like, how am I supposed to traverse this? This is not going to happen. So I ended up having to take them off and scale rocks in my bare feet. I was so mad. Uh, well, I had socks on, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, n- no shoes. It was terrible. Um, so, like, my feet ended up, like, hurting for most of the party. I I roller skated the best I could, but I had my boyfriend uh, drive around to pick me up in front of, because there was a space to drive around in front of the train station, and he came around and picked me up that way. But, like, it was raining at that point, so it was cold and raining. (laughs) I'm in a roller skates, and I was kind of mad. Luckily, I had other shoes in the car, but it, it just... Anyway, the highlight of the evening, though, was that my very dear friend, we called him Big Dave, that's what he liked to be called, so we weren't being mean, but um, he's like 6'4", and he's a really big guy, and he was dressed up as Papa Smurf, and I have pictures from that night where he had picked up one of our friends who was dressed like Spider-Man, and was like holding him like a baby. (laughs) It was super cute. It was fun, but like my, that was not, my costume was not the costume to wear to that party. It was, it was pretty bad. Anyway, so um, I hope that you're having a great time and staying spooky. Um, thanks so much. Bye. Oh, Dusty, poor Dusty. Wow. Roller girl. What a hilarious costume. And I, I love that the, my story about, uh, when I was Linda from Halloween getting caught in the rain and that you have this caught in the rain story, but it's also an overlap with my story where I talked about being a uh, drive-in diner waitress who was on skates. So we have two costumes in common. Your story overlaps two of my experiences. Getting caught in the rain in a uh, tedious costume, in a, a difficult to walk around in when it's wet costume, cumbersome. That's the word I was searching for, walking around in a wet, cumbersome costume and navigating hard to navigate terrain in roller skates. We have that in common. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I was not an adult when Boogie Nights came out, so I did not know that there was like, that it was very big for adults at that time, but I can imagine it's an excellent movie. I really love it. And of course, all the costumes in it are so cool and it's such a fun movie right up until it's like the 80s um but still such an excellent film and uh if you have any pictures of that look you know i would love to see them 
All right. Thanks so much for calling in. And again, Lanterns, please let me know of your hazardous costume stories, any successes, any fails, anything totally gone amok. I love to hear that kind of stuff. So let's now get into another eek mail. This one has the subject line, very uh, beguiling subject line, better than candy. Everyone loves the houses that give out the full-size candy bars, but when I was a kid, there was one house I liked even more. I don't know why, maybe she couldn't get out to buy candy, but there was one old woman who gave out quarters to trick-or-treaters. She always had paper cutout decorations in her windows, and every year she gave out quarters. It might not sound like a lot to modern trick-or-treaters, but in the 80s, a quarter could buy way more than you'd expect. Or maybe I was just a weird kid who valued money more than candy. (laughs) Appropriately enough, in 1989, my costume was Scrooge McDuck. Well, I should say my first costume. That year, I borrowed old costumes from my friends, and in addition to the normal trick-or-treating for candy, I went to her house over and over in a different costume each time. (laughs) I brought them all in a bag, which I hid in a bush near the road. After every trip to her door, I'd change costumes and go again. I had enough costumes that I made $3.50 that night. I know this might sound a bit mischievous, but since teenagers in my town were going around that same night with eggs and toilet paper, I think I was still a pretty good kid. And that money did end up being spent at the Scholastic Book Fair. (laughs) Hope my story made you smile, Dave. Dave, it made me smile, it made me giggle, it made me say, oh boy, Dave, I... I, you know, you got me there at the end because yes, of course, I'm going to, I'm going to feel a little like, oh no, that was (laughs) that poor old woman. But yes, you took it to the Scholastic Book Fair. So of course, very good job. It was going to the important things like lenticular rulers and holographic bookmarks and Fear Street novels. Um, so I applaud you for spending it wisely. Um, I just had this vision of you being like, and then I bought candy with it, (laughs) like candy that that old woman owed me. Um, I would have been psyched to get quarters as a kid, uh, even in the nineties. I, there was a guy who without a doubt would always give nickels and pennies. I feel like it was always like seven cents. Who knows why? I'm thinking maybe that seven cents was something that he got as a kid and it was a lot. And in his mind, he's always like, seven cents. That's the number of Halloween, the magical trick or treating number seven. So I was always happy with it because I am, I like to think I don't have Scrooge McDuck energy, but I do also like to uh, be thrifty and. have money to care for myself. So I loved, especially as a kid, I loved saving money. I had a little pink bunny tin that I would put all my um, paper money into and then a little wooden piggy bank that I'd put all my coins into. And I just loved getting money on Halloween because it was different than the candy. And uh, it was always jingling around at the bottom of like my plastic bucket. And so like the whole time trick or treating before I realized I was getting seven cents, I'd be like, oh, listen to that money rattle. Like I loved it. Um, This is very funny, Dave. Very clever. And I just (laughs) thinking of you on the road, just like a kid, like hurriedly like getting naked, switching costumes, like... (laughs) So silly, and I'm very glad you didn't egg or toilet paper anyone. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that memory. It's delightful. Um, As always, I want to hear your trick-or-treating memories, your Halloween party triumphs or disasters, your book and movie recommendations, and all haunted histories. Share them with me by calling into the All Hallows hotline at 802 Five three two dead, or write me an eek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. 
As I said at the top of the episode, if you love It's Always Halloween, please subscribe at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween or make a one-time donation over Venmo using our email address. It's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. You can also support the podcast by buying It's Always Halloween merch on Redbubble. That link is in our show notes and our Instagram as well. This episode of It's Always Halloween was sponsored by Keith Fitzgerald. Very cool dude. It was written, researched, and performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner, with help from your fellow Luceo lanterns, Dusty, Allison, Pat, Dave, and Rob. Thank you so much to all of you for contributing. The editing, sound design, and theme music today is by Pete Burns. Thank you so much, Pete. You can follow Pete at Mittenberries. If you want to follow me personally on Instagram or Twitter, you can do so at LTB Comedy. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. Here is a super cute and friendly, lovely one that we just got this week. The subject line is, I love Halloween. Perfect. Me too. And it is from Hellraiser. It goes on to say, love learning all the fun history about Halloween traditions and other spooky stuff. I especially like the way Luce thoughtfully and compassionately interrogates cultural appropriation and cultural exchange and harmful horror tropes. So, so much fun. Love the way that you engage with your fans. Thanks. Thank you, Hellraiser. You know I am picturing you as Pinhead right now, and I love it. Would love to count Pinhead as a fan of the podcast. So please uh, be like Hellraiser, be like Pinhead, leave us a review. We'll read it on the air. Um, And hey, thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you so much for listening to us. It has been another episode of It's Always Halloween. Please come back next time. Unless the Minotaur gets you.